Hey, last week we kicked off a brand new series called Talk to Me, where we are going to, over the next few weeks, look at uh, the Lord's Prayer together. And one of the ways that we want to kind of instill that in us is before every sermon, recite together the Lord's Prayer. And so you're going to see the Lord's Prayer on the screen, and let's say this together. Therefore, you should pray like this, Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. You guys can have a seat now. If you don't have a Bible, lift up your hand. Our Connect team would love to get you a copy of God's Word as our gift from us to you. You can turn to Matthew chapter 6. Today we are going to be in verse 9 as we kick off this series. Last week we looked at verses 5 through 8 and kind of the preamble to the Lord's Prayer where Jesus talks about uh, when you pray, make sure you don't pray to be seen by others. Don't make sure you don't pray to be heard by others. You are to be seen and to be heard by your Father in heaven. And we're kicking off today the Lord's Prayer, looking at the first kind of portion of this prayer. Our Father in heaven, let your name be honored as holy. I also want to remind you real quick about our 2020 Anticipate Vision. We kicked this off last year, and this is a big part of why we're spending time focused in on prayer, because we're asking the Lord to do things within our lives, within our church, within our city, and that's a big part of what we're doing with Anticipate. And so if you are new, we have these booklets out there in the lobby. You can grab one of those, and this will give you a snapshot of what our Anticipate vision is about, future impact, future generations, and future churches. We also have these journals out there in three different colors, and if you are a journaler, you like to journal your prayers, journal your Bible reading, this is a great resource. And lastly, we're in the middle of a season of prayer, 40-day season of prayer, and we have these bookmarks out there. And so if you want to join us, this is a great way. Every single day, the things we're praying for are on this bookmark. So it just so happens that today, you're praying for your pastors. So I appreciate your prayers. So that's today. Tomorrow, we're praying for our V-group leaders and hosts. Uh, Tuesday, our V-kids. Wednesday, our V-students. Thursday, our Next Generation Ministry at Meisler Middle School, just down the road on Cleary. Uh, Friday, we're praying for our missionaries in Southeast Asia, Scott and Wendy. And then on Saturday, we're praying for Dwell Church in Denver, Colorado. And so that will give you kind of an up-to-date of what we're praying for each and every day as we seek the Lord together. But we're going to kick off the Lord's Prayer this morning thinking about that. And when I think about the Lord's Prayer, I think back to high school. In high school, I was a wrestler. That was about 40 pounds ago. Uh, Yeah, we cut a lot of weight. I was a little skinnier then. It wasn't fun, but I enjoyed beating people. And so, you know, it was a legal way to kind of fight and win and win fights. And so we, we, we wrestled. And one of the things that was so interesting to me, on the varsity team, before every meet and before every tournament, we would all come together and the coach would lead us in the Lord's Prayer. And it started out uh, where you could understand clearly everything that was being said. And so this is how it, was, it would go. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. as in I mean, literally, you would just go, 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 go. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, does anybody know what we're actually praying? Because you can't even understand the last few words of what you're saying. And here's the reality. For some of us, depending on what tradition or if we grew up in a tradition, that might be familiar to you. Because just like we did just now, for 2,000 years... People have been reciting, memorizing, saying the Lord's Prayer. And it's important. I think we need to understand and we need to know the Lord's Prayer. I think we need to meditate on the Lord's Prayer. We need to use the Lord's Prayer as a guide to prayer, but not as a formula for prayer. That, that was kind of the, the, the thing that was happening with our wrestling team. It was, it was just formulaic. We were just saying it to say it. 
But what I want us to do over the next few weeks as we uncover and unpack what Jesus is teaching us is to be able to not just pray, our Father in heaven, let your name be honored as holy, but use that as a template for now how we should be praying. What what should we be saying when we pray to the Lord? And so over the next few weeks, that's what we're going to look at. The Lord's prayer is broken up into six petitions. The first three are very much God-centered, and the last three are more us-centered. And so that's what we're going to be looking at in the Lord's Prayer today. And so we're looking this morning at verse 9. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, let your name be honored as holy. And I want to ask you two questions this morning as we think about verse 9. The first question is this, Do we know who we're talking to? Now, you might have said this before. Do you know who you're talking to? Right? People have maybe said that to you. And for us, we need to think about that question as we address God. Because how does Jesus teach us to address God? Our Father in heaven. Now, the big key word there, there's many, but the first one that we're going to look at is Father. That word comes from the Greek word pater, which Jesus, while he might have known Greek or they spoke Greek around him, Jesus and his disciples spoke Aramaic. And the word that Matthew translates into Greek, pater, is the Aramaic word Abba. And Abba is a different word. I mean, it's not like saying father. It's more like saying daddy or dad. It's a term of endearment. It's not necessarily baby talk. Some people have kind of compared it to that. But it did convey a close, intimate relationship between a child and their father. And so Jesus, from the very start, is getting into this posture to help teach his disciples that when you approach God, you need to be reminded that you're approaching your father. And your father is not this estranged father. He's a close and dear parent. And so he, he's like your father. You call him dad. Not just some distant God off in the universe. But also, I think what Jesus is teaching us here is because God is our Father, we only pray to God. How many of you love the movie Mulan? Any Mulan fans? Everybody know there's going to be a live action one coming out soon? We were talking about this uh, as a team uh, a few weeks ago, and we started thinking about the song that she sings and the town people sing that I'm not even going to try and sing, right? It's the uh, You'll Bring Honor to Us All song. Once I mention it, you're going to have the tune in your head, and you're not going to be able to get it out of your head. Like Literally, during the week in the office, I've been singing the song, and I'm like, no, I don't want this song in my head. But listen to what Mulan says and what the townspeople say. She says this, ancestors, hear my plea. Help me not to make a fool of me and to not uproot my family tree. Keep my father standing tall. Scarier than the undertaker, we are meeting our matchmaker. Who does she pray to? Her ancestors. Look at what the townspeople then sing. Destiny, guard our girls and our future as it fast unfurls. Please look kindly on these cultured pearls, each a perfect porcelain doll. Who do the townspeople pray to? Destiny. What we need to be reminded of is that when we come to pray, it's not just some random prayer that we're praying. It's not to, hey, whoever's out there, whoever is listening. And in Jesus' day, the culture would have dictated that. Jesus was teaching his disciples and the crowds around them that were all probably Jewish. And so they would have understood that, listen, we're praying to God our Father. But as Christianity spread, it spread to cultures and people who worshipped the plurality of gods, who worshipped gods other than the God of the Bible. And so for you and I, we need to be reminded that as we approach God in prayer, He's not only our Father, but He's the only one we pray to. He's the only one that can not only hear our prayers, but also the only one who can answer our prayers. 
He is our Father. So where do we see God as Father in the Bible? Because some people think that this idea of God as our Father is is a novel idea. It's new with Jesus. But what I want us to see is that from the Old Testament to Jesus, this is an idea of God as our Father that Jesus is simply picking up and carrying. Look at Exodus 4 with me. What happens in Exodus 4, the people of Israel are in captivity. They're enslaved in Egypt. Moses, uh, God encounters Moses and reveals himself to Moses. And God tells Moses, go to Pharaoh and tell them this. Verse 22, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn, what? Son. And I say to you, let my what? Son. Go, that he may serve you. So God, as Father, is seeing the people of Israel, the son, his, as the people of Israel as his sons and daughters. Look at Isaiah 64, 8. On the other hand, but now, O Lord, you are our what? Father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. So in the Exodus passage, we see God recognizing the reality that he is the father of the people of Israel. And in the Isaiah passage, we see the people of Israel recognizing that they are sons and daughters of the father. Where else do we see God as father? Look at the life of King David. King David has a desire to build a temple for God. God comes to him and says, no, that's not for you. That's for your son Solomon. And as he's speaking to David, he says this about his relationship, God's relationship to his son Solomon. 2 Samuel 7, he says, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him. So in the life of David, we see God recognizing that he will be the father and that David's descendants, Solomon and others, will be the sons of God. We get to the New Testament and we see the person of Jesus. Now, Jesus is completely different and completely alike in so many different ways. Especially in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is kind of depicted and understood as this new and better and obedient Israel. And so Jesus is the better Israel who remains faithful to his Father. He understands this reality that he is the Son and that God is his Father, but unlike Israel who disobeyed God, Jesus chooses to obey his Father. We also see in the Bible, particularly the New Testament, how Jesus is the eternal Son who will redeem Israel. Because Israel disobeyed God, and ultimately all of humanity has disobeyed God, every single one of us need to be redeemed. We need to be brought back into a right relationship with God. And it's only because Jesus is the eternal Son who obeyed God that we are able to be brought back into right relationship. You see, and I don't even have all the time in the world to tell you this, right? But God has has existed eternally as a trinity, eternally in relationship. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three persons are God, yet they're all distinctly three persons. And so from eternity, Jesus has existed as the Son of God. And so he came because all of us as creatures of God have been separated from God. He came to right that relationship, to reconcile us back to God. And so Jesus shows us not only that God is our Father, but what it looks like to actually be a child of God. What the model is to be a son or a daughter of God. So what does it mean for God to be our Father? I want you to look at Galatians 4. Paul discusses this in this passage. I want want you to see what he says 
says. Look at Galatians 4, starting in verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, Jesus, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might. Jesus came for the purpose of us receiving adoption as sons. In the Greek text, that plural word can refer not just to sons, but daughters, so that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. Now look at what else it says in verse 6. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying what? Abba, Father. Now where did we just talk about Abba? Matthew 6, right? Where Jesus says, pray then like this, our Father or Abba. So do you see this relationship that's happening? And look at what Paul says as he closes this, these few verses. So all of that has happened. Jesus, God has sent his son Jesus. Jesus redeemed us. God sent the Spirit to be dwelling within us. What's the consequence? So you are no longer a slave but a son or a son and daughter. And if a son or if a daughter, then an heir through God. See, we're broken, sinful people. We have a, uh, an irreconcilable relationship with our Father. There's nothing that we can do in and of our own power to make ourselves right with God, make ourselves right with our Father. So what does God do? God is a good, loving, all-powerful Father who wants to be in relationship with his creation. So he sends his perfect, obedient son, Jesus, to earth to become just like us. And in becoming just like us, Jesus is able to represent us and therefore redeem us and reconcile this broken relationship that we have with our Father. And when he does that, when we repent of our sins... Repenting of our sins is important. Why are we repenting of our sins? Because our sins are the very thing that broke our relationship with God. And so if we're not willing to repent of our sins, then we're not willing to reconcile that relationship with our Father. So we turn away from our sins. We've been living one way, and we choose to live another way. And because of Jesus, we look to Jesus, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, the work of Jesus is what redeems us. It's what saves us. And when we repent and trust Jesus, Paul says in Galatians 4, the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, of the Godhead, comes into our hearts. And the presence of God dwells in us. And because of the Spirit of God, we are able to do what? Call God Father. This entire plan of redemption is about bringing us back into relationship with our Creator, that He would not just be our Creator, but He would be our Father. And everything Jesus is saying in Matthew 6 hinges on all of this, that we would be able to pray to God and call Him our Father. It's only because of the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that God becomes our Father and we become children of God. Last week I talked a little bit about this, but it's important to to think about this again because one of the issues that many of us have in praying to God as our Father is because we first think about our earthly examples of fathers. And for some of us, listen, some of us, we've had great examples of what it looks like to be a father. We had great earthly fathers, but some of us, we didn't have those great examples. But what I want you to see in all of this is the example. We're not trying to import our examples of earthly fathers onto our Father in heaven. They are not the example of what it looks like to be a father, whether it was a good example or a bad example. Jesus shows us that the example for fatherhood doesn't come from earthly fathers, but from our Father in heaven. So listen, if you want to know what it looks like to be a good father, don't look to all of us who are fathers. Look to our Father in heaven. Dads, future dads, do you want to know how to be a good dad? 
Look at your Bibles and read about who your Father in Heaven is. And then begin to emulate that. We need to be reminded that our Father in Heaven is an intimate, loving, merciful, compassionate, sacrificial, protector, counselor, and ultimately Father. That's who we pray to. He's our Father. But He's not just our Father, He's also our Father. The emphasis doesn't just lie in the fact that He's the Father, but that He is our Father. Eugene Peterson said it like this, Prayer is never solitary. We are never alone when we pray. We are with Jesus and all others who follow him. And so God is our Father because we are in Jesus. The thing that unites the church together, whether it's a different culture or a different country or a different language or a different background or a different tradition, is the fact that all of us are in Jesus. We have the same Redeemer, the same Savior, and then the thing that unites us from that is the fact that the church is filled with the Holy Spirit. So the reason that we are able to pray our Father in heaven, whether we're together in a corporate setting like this or whether we're at home praying by ourselves, is because we are united through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're praying together because of Jesus. But God is also our Father when we pray together. That's, that's why there's a great emphasis right now in our V groups. Our V groups are those small groups of 10 to 20 people who meet regularly throughout the city for transformation, connection, and multiplication. Part of the reason that we pray in smaller groups and we pray in gatherings like this together is because we should be praying together. Right? Last week when we talked about prayer, one of the things that I said, because Jesus said, what did he say in Matthew 6, 5-8? Don't pray for others to see you or others to hear you. Go in your closet, lock your door, and pray to your Father who sees and hears in secret. But the point that Jesus was getting at was not necessarily that we shouldn't pray in public. Because literally, what does he do in verse 9? Pray then like this, our Father in heaven. Recognizing that there are going to be moments when we are going to pray together publicly. And so God is not just my Father. He's not just your father. He's our father. And so we seek him together. The second thing that Jesus says, he says, our father in heaven. And I think this is just a small portion. There's so much that we could, we could go into thinking about heaven and what does that mean. But what I really want us to understand is what is Jesus trying to get at when he talks about our Father in heaven. And there's really two ideas that I think he's getting at. Number one, our Father is transcendent. Transcendent is a theological word that means this. God is infinitely exalted over creation. When we think of heaven, we recognize that it's above us, right? You think about heaven, where do you look? You look up, right? But we also recognize that heaven is not a physical space, it's a spiritual space. And the fact that when we think about God as God is in heaven, literally God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's right here in this moment. He's in Pittsburgh. He's in Denver. He's in India. He's everywhere. He's transcendent. Any of you eternal? I didn't think so, right? Any of you omnipresent? I didn't think so. Some of us want to be. I'd love to be omnipresent, right? None of us are those things. God is so much far above us. He's transcendent. But at the same time, by praying our Father in heaven, we're also learning this, that not only is our Father transcendent, our Father is imminent. Another theological word that means God is personally related to and involved in creation. So while at the same time we are praying and knowing and believing that God is everywhere and God has no beginning and no end, we're also praying and believing and knowing that he's intimately involved in the things that we need. That when we pray for that job or when we pray for that mode of transportation or when we pray for our health, we're not burdening God. Remember Bruce Almighty? 
Bruce becomes God, and he's like, I can't handle all of these prayer requests. Like, I can't, I can't manage all of them. That's not God. God's not overwhelmed when you bring him a request. God's not overwhelmed with someone praying to end poverty in our world, and you're praying for a job at the same time. God hears all of those things. He is, at the same time, transcendent as well as imminent. He is our Father in heaven. So we know how to pray, or we know who to pray to, but how should we pray? The second question that I think Jesus gets at in the second half of verse 9 is this, are we going to talk to him like that? You've heard that too, probably if you're a parent. You're going to talk to me like that? You're going to talk. I say this often. You better not talk to your mom like that, right? So for us, are we going to talk to him like that? The first thing that Jesus gets at is the name of God. Let your name, right, be honored as holy. And as we think about the name, we have to ask ourselves, what is the name of God? Again, the book of Exodus, the people of Israel are in captivity. Moses is in the the desert wandering as a shepherd, and he sees a burning bush, and he encounters God. And this is what God and Moses say to one another. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Wow, what a name, right? Anybody want to be named I am, I am what I am? Or I will be what I will be? But that's what God gets at, and we're going to talk about that. So God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So God gives his name, and then he clarifies in verse 15. God also said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And so the name of God is significant. And what, Mo, what God is doing here is he's naming himself. The, the word, I am what I am, comes from four Hebrew consonants, which we pronounce as Yahweh. It's literally, it's, it's Y-H-W-H. Ancient Hebrew didn't have vowels. Earlier, I, I went through a, a, a less, a, a, an English lesson, English grammar lesson. Do we all know our vowels? A E I O U. Sometimes and I can't believe that I, I was corrected on I was right and they, they tried to correct me. Did you know that W can sometimes be a vowel? Sometimes Y and W. Shame on you school teachers. Shame. Right? So but in ancient Hebrew, there were no vowels. And this name was honored so much that no one said it. Or no one wrote it. And so literally, the pronunciation of it is kind of lost. We don't really know because no one said it or no one wrote it. And in the ancient Hebrew and even modern day, they don't say or write this word. When they come to this word in the Hebrew Bible, they instead of saying Yahweh, they say Adonai. Adonai is the Hebrew word for Lord or Master or Sir. And so in all of this, what you see is how much reverence they had for the name of God. The fact that they would never write it or they would never say it. Because names meant something in the ancient world. It meant something for God to say, I am what I am or I will be what I will be. Think, of, go, think back to uh, the story of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah are old, old as in not able to have children old, right? God comes to them and says, you're going to have a child. What does Sarah do? She laughs. <laughs> they have a son. What do they call him? Isaac. Do you know what Isaac means? Laughter. Names carried meaning in the ancient world. And so God's name, the reason he says, 
Yahweh, I will be what I will be, or I am what I am, is because he was declaring something about who he is. God's name, just like we talked about as God, our Father in heaven, God's name is an example first of his transcendence. That part of in his name is just this this statement of existence. That before time, I am. Before time was, I will be. So part of what we learn from his name is simply his transcendence. But at the same time, in his name, we see his imminence. The fact that an eternal, all-powerful, omnipresent God exists and wants us to know his name reminds us that he's imminent, that he's close, that he's near. I mean, you just think about that, right? In, in, in mythology and in other cultures, the humans bothered the gods. They're like, those, those peons, we've got to deal with them, right? This, this God, our Father, stoops down to us. And he not only wants to have a relationship with us, but he wants us to know his name which is one of the most important things in a relationship, what you call another person when you encounter them, when you engage with them. So God is reminding us that in his name, yes, he is transcendent, but at the same time, he's imminent, he's near. He wants to have a relationship with us. And so we pray, our Father in heaven, let your name, the second part that we get to is be honored as holy. We honor God's name as holy because it stands in for who he is. Right? When you think about Dustin Turner, you think about me as a person. When you think about the name of God or you say our Father or you say Yahweh, you say Jesus, right? You think about the person of God. And so by Jesus challenging us to say, let your name be honored as holy, what we're doing is not just honoring the name of God, but actually honoring the person of God. In our prayer, I'm going to think about this. The last time you prayed, what was the first thing that you did in prayer? Did you say, our Father in heaven, and then begin to list off every single thing that you needed from God? Or did you first praise him? Did you first honor him? Because that's what Jesus is encouraging us and telling us to do. Because here's the reality. We do not make God's name or God himself holy. He already is. And so the point of this, right, there's a reason. Some of you I know have asked questions about what what translation are we reciting from, right? How many of you on a normal, everyday basis use the word hallowed? (laughs) Yesterday, that was such a hallowed event. You know, I met that hallowed person. No one does that, right? We don't use the word hallowed. And so we've been reciting the Christian Standard Bible because I think in this particular instance, they get at what the word means what it means to hallow something, to let God's name be honored as holy. So when we pray and we praise God first in our prayer, we're not making God or his name holy. It already is holy. We're simply honoring God for who he is. We're honoring his name. So the question for us as we think about this is how do we honor God's name as holy? What does it look like for us in our lives? The first thing I think is we obey God. We honor God's name as holy in obedience. I mean, think about this, right? As a kid or maybe your own kids, it mattered how you acted in public, did it not? When I go out to different places, it matters how my kids act in public. Why? Because it's a direct reflection on my parenting, So when my kids act a fool, I'm not happy because everybody looks at this guy like, man, what a dumb dad, right? But if my kids act well and they behave, that reflects on me. 
And our obedience is the exact same way. When we are obeying God in front of the entire world, when we are doing things and saying things and acting a certain way, and people look at us and they say, man, why do they act like that? And we say, why? Because God is our Father, because we're Christians. It reflects well upon God, not poorly. And so part of our lives, we're to live our lives in obedience to God because when we do, not only do our lives honor God as holy, but everyone around us sees how we're acting and behaving and they begin to honor God based on our behavior. We not only honor God's name as holy through our obedience, but second, we honor God's name as holy through our worship. Everybody's heard of a selfie, right? But have you ever heard of a shelfie? Might be new to you. I took a shelfie this week. Isn't that beautiful? It's incredible. Those are just a few of my bookshelves. And I could, you know, I could point out all of these books to you and, and share them with you. But the point of a shelfie is to put on display my shelf of some of my books and to, to showcase everything that's on that shelf. And when we worship God, it's like taking a shelfie and we showcase who God is. We help you see who He is. This is worship, not, not this. This isn't worship, okay? This isn't idolatry, I promise you. I keep that in check. But showcasing God, is worship. And whether it's in our lives or whether it's in our prayer life, that's what we've been called to do, to showcase God. Here's the incredible thing about that. When I'm, I look at this picture, I'm able to take books off this shelf and show you a particular part of this book or tell you why I think you need to read that book, right? In the same way, when we worship God, I'm able to stop and worship God and show you why He deserves worship. Because He's holy. Because He's omnipresent. Because He's eternal. Because He's all-powerful. Because He's not only our creator and sustainer, but redeemer. When we worship God, we showcase God. And that's what Jesus is getting at in this prayer. The first and most important thing that you and I need to do in prayer is not bring God our requests. But honor him as holy first and foremost. That's what we have to do. The point of this series is not for you to memorize the Lord's Prayer. But this week, I want to encourage you when you go to pray, when you pray over these different things each and every day, I don't want you to go to God and say, Hey, today I'm praying for Pastor Dustin. I need your prayers. But first and foremost, I want you to go to God and honor Him as holy because He deserves your praise. And so when Jesus teaches us to pray, there's a reason we pray, Our Father in heaven, let Your name be honored as holy. And so this week, I want us to reflect on those words with two questions. Number one, is God your Father? Now that question can go in two different directions. First, Jesus teaches us how to pray. And what does he assume right off the bat? That God is our Father. How is God our Father? Through the person of Jesus. And so the first thing that all of us have to address is whether or not we know Jesus. Whether or not we are sons and daughters of God through Jesus. And if you're not, the Bible tells us to repent, to turn away from our sins. And because of the work of Jesus, trust in the person of Jesus. The life, death, burial, and resurrection. To trust Him. The second way this question can go is not just to recognize whether or not God is our Father, but whether or not we want to call God our Father. For some of us, although we're Christians, we struggle with God as our Father because of what we've seen 
from our fathers. But it's important to recognize that even though our earthly examples have not been great fathers, our Father in heaven is perfect. And we can still call him our Father. So is God your Father? But the second question is this, is how will you honor God's name this week? In just a moment, we're going to spend some time in prayer. And yes, I want you to think about this week, when you pray to God, how are you honoring God as holy? But don't just think about your prayer life. This week, when you're at work, this week, when you're at home, This week, when you're out with friends, how will you honor God as holy? Because how you honor God's name and how you honor God's person as holy will ultimately reflect not only on you, but on Him. And so this week, we pray, our Father in heaven, let your name be honored holy. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being our Father. Help us now as we respond to you. Help us to let your name be honored as holy. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.